Hi everyone, how are you? I hope that you are all at home staying safe and healthy, as I know you have been. It is Sunday night and I'm getting this video recorded for your next week of distance learning. So uh, when you look at this tomorrow morning, you will find that this video is pretty short. You are going to watch this video. It's going to cover the first five slides of the 2000s, and then you are going to stop it, and you are actually going to go and you are going to watch another video on YouTube. You're going to be watching a movie called In Memoriam, and it is about the attacks against the United States on September 11th, and it will walk you uh, through what the day looked like for Rudy Giuliani. It's a pretty intense but very well done documentary from HBO and it is on YouTube. So you will be getting a chance to watch that. You'll answer some questions about that documentary. It is about an hour long and that will be your only assignment for the week. So I am going to share my screen now so that we can get started. All right, minimize myself. We have finally made it. We are at the year 2000. We have made it to the next century. Obviously, everything went just fine after Y2K. And we are starting off in the year 2000. So to start with, let's talk about the economy at the very beginning of the year 2000, um, we start to see a change in the economic growth of Vietnam. So there was a major financial crisis in Asia in the late 1990s, and that did affect Vietnam. It affected Southeast Asia as a whole, and the Vietnamese economy turned down at that point. However, its economy began to recover in 1999. And then we see a major rate, uh, major, majorly steady rate of growth from 2000 to 2005. And this becomes one of the world's fastest growing economies. Even after the late 2000s global recession, Vietnam's growth has remained strong. Vietnam is, even today in 2020 right now, under a lot of fire globally for its human rights violations. It remains a very strong country economically. It joined the WTO, the World Trade Organization, in 2007 and has remained a major economic world player. Also in early 2000, uh, in May of 2000, we see the second Chechen war occur. I mentioned this briefly when we talked about the first Chechen war um, a couple of weeks ago, but in 2000, Vladimir Putin was elected to be president of Russia. After he became president, Russia, under his direction, moved into Chechnya and established direct rule of it in May 2000. So if you'll remember, after the end of the first Chechen war, it was decided that Chechnya would be able to rule over itself, still part of Russia, so it wouldn't be separate, um, but that it would be able to, you know, control what was going on in its own region. Well, Putin was not a fan of that plan, and so he began a full-scale offensive in 2000. Chechen militant resistance throughout the region continued to do very well to inflict heavy Russian casualties and was able to challenge Russian political control for several more years. However, that was not always something that was easy for them, okay? There were also a lot of, there's a lot of uh, instability in the region for the Chechens during this time and a lot of attacks against them as well. Uh, we also, during this time of the Russian attacks on the Chechen region, uh, we see a lot of other human rights violations by Russia, by the separatist forces, and this draws a lot of international attack against them. And so in 2009, Russia withdrew, ending the Second Chechen War. But it does last for those nine years, for almost the entire decade. Today, there is still significant tension between both the Chechens and the Russians. Then, in September of 2000, the Second Intifada began. So, remember, the First Intifada starts in the late 1980s. It does not end until 1993, when the Oslo Accord is signed. 
The second intifada is another period of intensified Israeli-Palestinian violence. Palestinians describe it as an uprising against Israel. So why did this start? We had gone this whole time with relative peace. All of a sudden there is this intensified violence. Why does it occur? Well, it started in September 2000 after future Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, that's him here in the middle, um, he became prime minister in 2001. He was prime minister from 2001 until 2006. But in September of 2000, before he was officially made prime minister, he made a visit to the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is a location in Jerusalem. It is a very religious site. It is the holiest site in Judaism, and it is the third holiest site in Islam. So this is a an area, um, a spot of land, a religious site, that is very important to these two major religions in the region. So when he makes a visit to the Temple Mount, the Palestinians see this as highly provocative, and they decide that this is cause for this intensified violence against Israelis. At this point, Palestinians, and during the Second Intifada throughout it, it they primarily attack using suicide bombings. That is the number one way in which we see this violence intensify. And as a response to this, Israel built a wall around the West Bank. That wall today has been condemned by many individuals um, globally. Um, Israel has been very much attacked um, and looked down upon for building this wall. By building this wall, they have essentially created a third world country in parts of the West Bank, and it really hurts the people there. They did it obviously with the intention of protecting the Israeli people. However, in the process of trying to protect some people, they have greatly hurt the Palestinians that live on the other side of that wall. The Second Intifada does come to an end, but that does not happen until the mid-2000s when a deal is come to between the Israelis and the Palestinians to bring an end to it. 2000 was a very busy year, as you can tell. And at the end of 2000, uh, we see a very major political decision in the United States occur, and that is the decision by the Supreme Court in Bush v. Gore. The 2000 presidential election, which happened in November of 2000, was a very close election. Candidate Al Gore, he was the Democratic candidate for president, he narrowly, barely won the popular vote, but neither he nor presidential candidate, Republican George W. Bush, won the 270 electoral votes needed to actually win the election. The results in Florida were so close that the ballots had to be recounted. And thousands of ballots were thrown out because they were unclear, because the vote, recounting, the vote counting machines had a glitch to them. Well, after the recount, Bush was declared the winner by 537 votes. But, Gore's lawyers came in and argued that thousands of ballots were still uncounted and they couldn't be thrown out. They had to go back and actually count them. So the Florida Supreme Court ordered all Florida counties to begin a hand recount of ballots rejected by the counting machines. So any ballot that the counting machine would not count that it had rejected would then be counted in this hand count. Well, during this time, George W. Bush requested the US Supreme Court to intervene. As this hand recounting began, the US Supreme Court came to a decision in the case known as Bush v. Gore. On December 12, 2000, the court ruled that the hand recounts in Florida were unconstitutional. The court ruled that they violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution because different vote counters used different standards. And the recount did not actually treat all voters and therefore their votes equally. And the court also said that even if they could do this equally, the court ruled there was not enough time to recount the votes. There's a deadline to win. There has to be a certified winner. And the court ruled that there was no way that even if it could be done equally, that it could be done equally within the deadline. And so the ruling left Bush as the winner with those 537 votes, declared the certified winner in Florida, which gave him the electoral votes that he needed to win the presidential election. 
And on January 20th, 2001, George W. Bush became the 43rd president of the United States at a time when he had no idea what was about to be in store for him, his presidency, and the world. On September 11th, 2001, a beautiful, sunny, gorgeous Tuesday morning, it quickly turned to not be so gorgeous. 19 Al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked four fuel-loaded U.S. commercial airplanes that were all bound for West Coast destinations. They were fuel-heavy airplanes. A total of 2,977 people were killed in New York City, Washington, D.C., and just outside of a small town in Pennsylvania known as Shanksville. If you look on this map here, you can see two of those flights left from Boston. Those are the two flights that flew into the World Trade Center towers, which you can see in this picture on the right. One flight left from New York City. That is the flight that was brought down in the field in Shanksville. And then one flight left from Washington, D.C., flew out and returned to Washington, D.C., and that is the plane that crashed just outside of the Pentagon. While you are all too young to remember this, many of you have learned about it before. You have heard many different things about it. The video that you are going to watch is going to give you the opportunity to learn a little bit more. Al-Qaeda had planned uh, smaller attacks throughout the 1990s. Some of you did extra research and chose the topic of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. That was also planned by Al-Qaeda. We see smaller attacks occur around the world. Um, Al-Qaeda attempting to attack US soldiers, US citizens um, around the world. There is one specific attack that occurred in October of 2000. Al-Qaeda attacked a ship in a port in Yemen in the Middle East, a ship known as the USS Cole. When it attacked the ship, um, men, drove up to the ship, uh, it was docked, rode up to it in another boat, set off a bomb, and killed 17 Americans in the process. This is the attack that we later learned gave them the confidence to plan the attacks on 9-11 that killed nearly 3,000 people. This is a day that, as I know you have heard before, is one that no one who lived through it will ever forget. Some, some of you have been to New York City. Um, I know some of you went there for your eighth grade trip. Some of you did not. Um, but if you ever have the chance to go, you can go down um, to the financial district and actually go to the museum. The 9-11 Museum is an incredible museum. Um, it is a very solemn experience, but one that I think you will find is an important one to experience. Um, also, if you are ever out in Pennsylvania, about an hour and a half, two hours away from Pittsburgh, is that field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. My husband and I had the opportunity to go there uh, about three years ago now. And it was a very beautiful area um, with a very well done memorial to the people who died aboard the airplane that day. Um, there's a small museum at the site, as well as this very beautiful memorial dedicated to the memory of those people who were able to bring down that plane. At this point, you are going to stop watching this video because I'm going to end it. And like I said, you are going to head over to the link um, that is included in the email. You are going to watch the HBO documentary In Memoriam which follows Rudy Giuliani on the date of the attack on September 11th. Uh, he had news cameras following him for another video. Um, they were just making a documentary about him. And while they were filming, the attacks occurred and they continue to film as they follow him throughout the day um, and speak to him and his staff as they reflect on it. As I said, it is an intense video, please, Watch it slowly um, and take it all in as you do. Of course, if you have any questions about any of this, please reach out to me, whether by email or um, 
commenting on this video. Either one is fine, but please do reach out if you have any questions. Otherwise, I look forward to reading your answers about the video. Hope you guys all have a great week.